Today we're here with Marianne Gunderson from Wake Forest, North Carolina, and Marianne is probably more um, more well known as Marianne Dawson to people in the White Lake area. And Marianne, how about if you tell us um, what your connection is to the White Lake area? In 1973, um, I moved to White Lake. My husband had a job there with the, with the Montague schools, and we had a one-year-old uh, boy. So we were really thrilled to, to move into a community that had a lot of um, natural features, uh, such as the lake and, of course, Lake Michigan, and just a lot of opportunities to enjoy the outdoors. And I think I lived there until probably moved out of the Montague area around, uh, moved to Whitehall around 1989, and then again moved uh, to Muskegon around 1991. Uh, when did you um, first started, ha when did you first start having concerns about pollution? Very shortly after moving there, someone told us we got information that was just generally known that the, the tannery had been um, putting waste uh, animal skins, hides, into, into the lake. Um, and that that was, of course, at the, I guess that would be the east end of the lake, and so that there was some pollution from that. Um, and then after we'd been there about a year, we noticed that intermittently there were these fumes that, that would permeate our neighborhood and even our home, and they were kind of uh, chlorinated fumes. And uh, when we asked others in the area what that might be, it was suggested that it could be coming from the Hooker chemical plant. And that made sense because they had a, a chloralkali process going on there where they were um, you know, using the, the salt to, to produce uh, caustic and, and chlorine as well. So uh, that made sense. What were your concerns about the fumes? Well, my concern was a, just strictly a health concern. They were not pleasant fumes, so there was the aesthetic part of it. But uh, the real concern that I had was with health. I didn't know what this byproduct was. I didn't know if it would affect our health. Uh, I noticed that there were some trees that were blighted in the vicinity of the plant. I wondered if that had to do with, with the emissions. So it was basically a public health concern that I had. What did you do about your concerns? Well, I asked around. I wanted to, I, I do have some scientific background. I've been a science teacher throughout my career. And so I did an informal survey and to find out uh, which the source of, of, of the fumes from the standpoint of when they occurred and when the wind is blowing from a certain direction and so on. So it was an informal poll of neighbors in the area. And after doing that, I was convinced um, this survey pointed to the Hooker Chemical Plant as the source. Were there other people in the community that were concerned? Yes. As, as I polled the neighbors, I found a great deal of concern uh, in the communities that were closest uh, to this operation. Were there people in the community who were outspoken? Not at the time. Uh, so we got together. I can't remember, you know, the exact specifics of this, but I know at one point the concerned neighbors got together, and they invited um, DNR officials to uh, um, Montague so that we could voice our concerns to them. The the activities of Wint Dahlstrom, maybe, and Bob Wesley. All right, uh, Wint Dahlstrom uh, was, was very uh, concerned about it, and he was the most knowledgeable person in the community. He'd been aware of this problem, and so uh, besides being an attorney, he, he seemed to have a lot of scientific background enough to explain what was happening at the plant and really give me the, the background, and all of us the background that we needed to know what could possibly be going on there that was causing this air pollution. At, at the time, we didn't um, know that there were wells in the area that were also being uh, affected by the C-56. Uh, I had never heard of um, hexachlorocyclopenadiene before, and, and as it turns out, the DNR was aware of it, 
we were aware, uh, we found out at this meeting that that was one of the waste products and that it could indeed have a chlorinated um, scent to it. When you found this out, what kind of actions did you take as far as writing letters or organizing? Um, what, what are some of the things that you did? Well, besides the survey uh, and uh, helping to organize this group of concerned citizens, I think the result of that was a hearing. Um, the officials from Lansing, the DNR, came to um, Montague, and I remember that there was some kind of a public hearing in the gymnasium of the high school where uh, we were asked to air our concerns, and then the DNR, in turn, um, they had some time to prepare for it. Uh, they gave us some results, uh, not only of what the plant could be giving off and what they were, as opposed to what they were actually uh, licensed to do there. And so they, they were very concerned. That was the result, is that indeed there could be some uh, air pollution and there was also some water pollution because they had had some fish that they had collected just routinely. I guess they, the DNR um, collects fish from um, recreational uh, sites around the state, and they just happened to have some fish that they had collected from White Lake. And they got those fish out and, and analyzed them and found that they did have trace amounts of this compound, C56 in them. So then right away there was uh, an additional concern, what's happening to our fishery? And if we have a contaminated fishery, does that mean that um, the um, tourist or you know the uh, sport fishing industry in the area is going to be affected? So we had a double concern at that point. Did you have any um, connection at all or interaction with the Water Resources Commission? Water Resources Commission, um, definitely, because this entire episode issue re resulted in a, a very expensive cleanup. Uh, it was about a $20 million cleanup, I remember. Uh, they had to take the contaminated soil from the Hooker property, they had to contain it in a large uh, clay-lined uh, retaining vault. That had to have monitoring wells around it, it had to have the air around it monitored uh, in, into perpetuity. Uh, also, they discovered that the groundwater was migrating toward the lake, of course, and uh, they had to install interceptor wells to um, capture that water before it, it reached the lake. So it resulted in, in a huge cleanup. So uh, I, I guess I'm pleased that there was a solution to the problem, but it was very, uh, very expensive and very long term. You know, this this happened back in the late 1970s, maybe around 1980, and, and those uh, uh, interceptor wells and, and air monitoring devices are still operating. So it, it's a long term expense as well as the initial expense. I um, was able to to look at a documentary called The Tragedy of White Lake, and in it, um, assistant. Attorney General Stuart Freeman said that he first he first heard about C-56 at an air pollution control hearing where you testified, and he said, you know, that got his attention, and he said up until then the Water Resources Commission had um, um, not been aware of the issue or had ignored the issue. I remember Stuart Freeman very well, and I am appreciative of the fact that Yes, he uh, noticed that, he took notice of it, and he took action. So he was very instrumental in having a satisfactory outcome. Um, what, what can you tell us about Warren Dobson? Um, Warren Dobson worked for Hooker Chemical and um, uh, left, left um, quit and um, alerted um, the authorities to the the, the drums on the, the property. Oh, that name didn't register right away. Uh, was he a former hooker employee? Yes. Was a whistleblower? Yes. All right. I don't know that I ever met the man. Um, it, was, um, it was Attorney Dahlstrom who had contact with him. 
but that was also key. I admired him very much for placing himself in jeopardy as far as his job was concerned. He didn't feel safe after he'd done the whistleblowing, but he was the one that confirmed to us that uh, the residue from the um, C-56 uh, was being dumped directly uh, into the groundwater through the very, well, the water table out there is very high. Uh, I don't know how many feet it is under the surface, but it's a very shallow water table. And he was the one that was witness to the dumping that was later confirmed by the DNR. It was the illegal dumping of toxic waste. Do you uh, recall um, um, articles or editorials written by Darwin Bennett? with the, the weekly paper. I don't specifically remember that. Uh, his name is just a big memory to me. Um, I don't remember about uh, opinions that were expressed, but basically there were two camps. There were the camps, there was the camp that had vested interest, either in the tourist uh, industry, or uh, they were somehow um, related to the, the prospects of Hooker, or maybe they were employed there, and so that was one faction. They didn't want to be hearing this. this. This was news that was bad news as far as their own personal economic welfare, and I can understand that. And then there was the other camp that didn't have any kind of a vested financial interest in this, but they were just concerned citizens like myself who were wanting to get to the bottom of it and were, were frightened about the possibility that we were living in a poisoned environment. Um, was it um, was it uh, a frequent topic in the community, and did you feel any pressure not to speak out, or or uh, feel like the controversy um, might affect you or or your family? Yes, vaguely. Uh, th there were some ramifications uh, for us. Uh, for example, my uh, our little boy. By the time this happened, he was he was older. He was in school. Most of this uh, happened around from about 1976 to 77, 78, and I think by 1980, 89, it had really been resolved with the cleanup. But in the early stages, yes, we were subject to ridicule. We were, um, people didn't want, we were the messengers and people didn't want to hear the message. So of course, we came under attack. My son was taunted in school by other children that called him names and referred to his troublemaking mother, so forth. Uh, one, we owned a little um, Volkswagen Beetle at the time, and we didn't have a garage. We lived on Old Channel Trail, so one morning we found, we went out and found that it had been pelted with raw eggs, which, is, as you know, it had dried by then, so it was, um, we had to redo part of the paint job. So, but there was nothing really serious, nothing that um, really uh, has affected us long range whatsoever. And just looking back on it, it was just something that needed to be done. And I just happened to be the person who was one of the victims and um, felt motivated to find out what was going on. And then when we did have something done about it, we did have to do some prodding with respect to getting the kind of cleanup that we wanted. I, I can remember one instance when we went to uh, Lansing and we met uh, with I believe Stuart Freeman was at the meeting, and the Attorney General was at the meeting, and we weren't satisfied with the cleanup that was being proposed. We wanted more security. I think one of the issues was the thickness of the clay retaining vault. We wanted more thickness there. We wanted more monitoring. And so we went there and applied some political pressure, and we got what we needed. Did you, did you know any people who worked at the plant? And did you talk to any of them about the issues? No. Um, I don't know how many of the uh, people who came to the meeting were from Hooker. That, that, that is the initial meeting of concerned citizens. I heard afterwards that there were Hooker employees there because they wanted to observe. But I didn't know who they were. And no, I can't remember 
having any face-to-face -face experiences with Booker employees. But of course, uh, they were obviously unhappy with what was happening because they thought uh, there might be a possibility they would ultimately lose their job. The Hooker chemical issue kind of put the White Lake area on, in, the, in the national spotlight. How do you feel the, you know, the overall issue affected the, the White Lake area? I don't really know that. Um, as I said, I moved away from White Lake. It wasn't in the late 90s. It's actually the early 90s, I believe. And so I, I really have lost lost touch. I certainly hope that it has recovered. I know that there was a, there had to be economic impact because this problem was widely known. There was a lot of discussion as to whether the fish were safe to eat and so forth. So I know that there was negative impact, and I, I'm hoping that um, the cleanup has, has done its job, has, has uh, restored the lake to the condition that it was in before um, it was uh, abused. What did you think about the companies that were eventually found responsible for the pollution? Well, I, I just felt that it could have been part of a larger mindset that uh, of, of industry, older industry, and I think we've become a lot more enlightened over the years through uh, incidents such as this. Uh, the various Superfund sites, I know that Muskegon County was very heavily polluted with a number of Superfund sites um, during my, my residency there. And I just think we've learned, and what, what we've learned as a people and as an industry is we have to uh, be proactive. We can't just receive a new company or a new enterprise into our community without asking the questions that need to be asked. And our government is doing a pretty good job of this because uh, now environmental impact statements are required for any new uh, operation that, that might cause um, some kind of environmental impact. But I still think that there is a big role for the public because uh, what the hooker um, incident really brought out to me is that citizens do have to be watchdogs because the DNR and other governmental um, agencies can't do the job. They can't know what everybody's doing all the time. It's just too big a job. And the government these days, because of the, the weak economy, the government being cut back, I think it, it's... Um, more, even more important for citizens to take part of that role. To just uh, make sure that things are being done in the way they should. And uh, without citizen watchdogging, um, you're going to have things happen that are going to impact everybody in the long run. Now, if Hooker had done the right thing, if they had been forthright about the use of water in the plant, for example, the citizens asked some citizens asked before Hooker located there, will you be using White Lake water? And the answer was no. Well, as it turned out, they were using White Lake water as a receptacle for um, contaminants that they couldn't otherwise handle on site. So we, ju we just have to be vigilant. Um, one of the lessons from this is that you really should do things right in the first place. Um, by right, I mean do things in a way that you are being responsible to protect the natural environment and the people that are living in the vicinity of, of your enterprise. It's just being a good neighbor. That's, that's what it comes down to. Do the right thing because we've seen in this case they didn't do the right thing and it had a negative impact on the company as well as everybody else concerned. You think the, the issue of pollution, the problems, um, change the community in some way or change the community oh, mindset? I think so. I think it was a lesson learned and I, I think uh, anyone who was around um, during this controversy and, and, and we were wrestling with what to do and, and so forth, I don't know how anyone could help but um, just be a lot more aware. What um, um, going back to the days when the pollution issues were, were kind of big in the community and, and still not addressed, what did you think of community leaders? Um, were they um, 
helpful? Did they pay attention to the issues or were they not knowledgeable? I really cannot speak for their level of knowledge. I was not active in, in local government. I'm ashamed to say that. As a, as a citizen other than voting, I was mainly concerned with uh, school issues because that's where my husband worked. But um, I, I've always cared very much about the environment. Um, I was uh, one of the organizers of the first Earth Day that we celebrated when I was living up in Mount Pleasant but back in, in 1970. So I've always been a, a strong advocate. But as far as, as government, the only individual I can remember there is, uh, I believe he was mayor of Whitehall at the time, Norm Allman. And he uh, was concerned about this. And I thought he was very proactive. And, and I admired him for just uh, having rather than a defensive attitude toward it and wanting to minimize um, the news that was that was breaking regarding this. He, he, just, he just took it head on. What's happening and what can we do? Got it. You know, how do you feel about state government as far as dealing with the Water Resources Commission and the DNR and folks, um, you know, any lessons learned there? Well, I was, I was happy with uh, the response. I, I felt that um, there was, you know, no attempt to evade anything. Uh, they, they were very forthright with us uh, when we came to them with our concerns and, for the, and, and with the information that we had to give them. I thought that they were very responsive. So I, I really have no complaint. Uh, the only thing I would say, as I've mentioned this previously, is that as a state agency, their ability to do their job is directly related to the funding. And if the funding isn't there, then the monitoring is not going to be there. So, so then the citizens are going to have to take up some of the slack and, and just be aware of what's going on. So at least they can report things. Do, do you have any um, knowledge of, of the, the health of, of White Lake at this time? I do not. I've been away from there for some time. I've been, lived in North Carolina now for uh, almost 13 years, so I, I, I do visit. I do go back and visit. I'm aware that uh, uh, there is still a very active uh, community there, in, in, including the, the um, Great Lakes Federation and some of the groups that are monitoring uh, the lakes. So I think uh, also there are the, the uh, Grand Valley uh, uh, vessel that is, is operating out of Muskegon, plus there is a water quality center there, so I think uh, Muskegon itself has become a, a, probably a statewide center uh, concerning the quality of the Great Lakes and the Inland Lakes. So I think that's, that's to Muskegon's credit to be uh, hosting that type of activity. Do you have anything else that you would like to add that I didn't ask you? No, I, I um, just perspective that I gained from this is that we just need to um, care, be responsible with what we do, whether it could be anything from a citizen, you know, throwing trash out of their car, and causing that kind of a environmental eyesore, eyesore uh, to uh, industry re uh, behaving in a responsible way. So I, I just think that we need to um, take that responsibility. You know, I'm, I'm a I'm a, a Christian, a believer in the Word of God, and, and if I could just share with you one of the verses that is often skipped over, and that is Genesis 2.15, which says that um, we need, that God put man in the garden to keep it and to care for it. And the only other direct order that he gave was to, um, to multiply. So we've been a We've done a really good job of multiplying. So we need to go back to the other thing <laughs> that we've been given as a job, and that is to be good stewards of the environment, of the garden, so to speak. If this is the garden, this is the planet that we've been given. Very gracious. And we just need to, to do that job as well as the job of multiplying. Well, thank you very much, Marion. And happy Earth Day. Thank you. Same to you.